and we're back. Welcome back, and happy Thursday. Today, we will finish up with our module on regression. But before we begin, some administrative bits. The reading material is up on the course blackboard. We have PDF, as well as a YouTube video from a certain point, 21 minutes and 31, 39 seconds in the video. Written exam number two, will be a 24-hour take-home, will be administered on the 13th of April at the outset of class, and it will close 24 hours thereafter on the 14th at 9.30 in the morning. All right, so why don't we continue? When we last left off, we talked about this idea of a residual, that difference between the current working hypothesis on a particular input from our in-sample data and the ground truth target functions label. And this label is real valued, and there's a unique YN, a real valued label, corresponding to each XN. We take the difference and we square it because we're concerned about the magnitude, but not the direction. And what we called our in-sample error, EN of H, is specific to a hypothesis because the particular instantiation of a hypothesis, our weight vector, is going to determine what that squared error loss is. So we average squared error loss for the hypothesis across all of our big N, many in-sample points. So this gives us our expression for in-sample error, and that's what we use to measure the coincidence between a current working hypothesis and the labeling across the entire data set by our unknown target function. And so with this, we showed two different set of residuals, one for a one-feature regression model, that's our frame on the left, and the other for a two-feature regression model, that's our frame on the right. So why don't we continue forward? So let's look at linear regression. We start with our expression for in-sample error. Now, of course, we substitute for h of x, the definition of h of x, that score, that weighted sum, which we said from before is w transpose x, where our w vector is augmented with w naught, and our x vector, excuse me, is augmented with x naught. There's a typo there, that should be xn. So nonetheless, we're gonna substitute for h of x what our definition is, w transpose x, and that's our weighted sum, W1 times X1, W2, X2, rather W0 times X0, W1 times X1, up to and including Wn times Xn. And so this is our substitution for H of X. And now we're going to compute this in-sample error using our linear system, our matrices. And so we're going to construct what the statisticians call a design matrix. And this design matrix, what we're going to call big X, is going to contain in each of its rows an input from our big N many in-sample points, our data set. So we said for a particular vector, xi, is in d plus 1 dimensions, and it is a column vector, and so it is going to be d plus 1 rows and one column. And so that would be x naught, and then we're going to have xi, the first feature, xi second feature up to and including xid the third the d feature and so here if we take our i vector and we take its transpose xi vector transpose that swaps the rows and the columns and so we have x naught xi1 up to xid so this means our transpose data points, data vectors augmented, are going to be so-called row vectors. And so our design matrix is going to be a so-called row matrix because the rows of that matrix, each is one of these augmented input vectors. And so here, if we were to write out what this design matrix looks like, that's our design matrix X, and we're going to have big N many rows and D plus one columns. The N many rows is because each row is one of those big N many 
input vectors are in sample data points, and the columns are those D plus one features going from X naught to XI1 up to and including XID. And so the measurements or the rank of this design matrix, X is going to be an N by D plus one. Here N is the number of rows, and D plus one is the number of columns. So we have our design matrix, and let's recall that our W vector, W, it is also a column vector. And the standard is that we're going to employ is that all vectors start out as column vectors. So that's going to be augmented, W0, W1, up to and including WD. Okay. So now we have our design matrix. That's all of our data. We can construct that easily in something like MATLAB. And then we have our W vector, W, which is a column vector, W0, W1, up to and including WD. And so now we take this expression for in-sample error and we observe some things about this expression. Now, we have a sum here, and that sum is over these individual squared error losses. They're squared. And so if we're going to square this, we're going to have W transpose X sub N minus Y sub N times W transpose X N minus Y sub N. Now, of course, if you're going to multiply a vector times itself, you take the first version of a vector, you take the transpose of it, and then you multiply it by itself because the ranks need to be compatible with one another. And so now this W transpose XN, that's taking your W vector and your X vector and multiplying position by position X naught times W naught, X1 times W1 up to including XID times WD. And so how can we compute that and then subtract the YN value? Well, that's just taking the first row of our design matrix, that's X1, multiplying by W. So when you multiply, multiply matrix, you row across the river and then down the stream, as we alluded to before, the previous module. So we take X1 times W, okay, that's the first product in the first term, and then we take that result, X1 times W, and we subtract that particular position of Y. Now, this also means we need, in matrix or vector form, all of these labels associated with the ground truth target function. And this is going to be our target vector, target vector. Now, this target vector contains n values. It is a column vector, so its rank is going to be n by 1. And so this target vector is going to have each one of these target values so that when we perform this multiplication, X1, row across, down the stream, that's going to be X1 times W minus Y. And so we can construct this expression using matrices and vectors, and vectors are just special matrices, where one of the dimensions, the measurements, is one. We can use matrices and vectors to construct this expression for in-sample error across the whole data set by constructing this design matrix. Okay, so let's take a look at this expression in vector matrix format, and we'll unpack this a little bit more on the next slide. So that's one upon n. We have the magnitude squared of our design matrix times our column vector w. We take that product, that result, and we subtract off our target vector. That's a column, so a column vector. And so if we look at what it means to take the magnitude of something, well, if we have our XW, XW, we said we have our design matrix X. In the first position, we have X1 transpose up to that nth position, the nth row, we have XN transpose. And you also have your W vector, that's W naught, up to including W 
D. So now if we multiply this row by that column, our resultant vector that we get, XW, that's going to be a column vector. And so that XW, XW is going to be a column vector. It's going to be N by 1. The first position is going to contain X1 transpose times W. The next position is going to be X2 transpose times W. That last position is going to be X big N transpose times W. And so this multiplication of the design matrix with our wave vector is going to give you all of these terms from our expression for in-sample error. So then you take that multiplication of XW, and then you subtract off our Y vector, our target vector. That's going to be Y1 through Y big N. So if you subtract vectors from one another, the result is going to be a value here, x1 transpose w minus y1. You're going to have x2 transpose w minus y2 up to and including x big N transpose w minus y n. So, of course, now we have an expression for this entire term inside of this parenthesized expression, which is squared. So now that's where this magnitude comes in. Magnitude says, I'm going to take this, compute its transpose, and then multiply it by itself and take the square root of that. So I'm going to take the transpose of this and then multiply it by itself. That's going to be x1 transpose w minus y1, x2 transpose w minus y2, up to and including x big N transpose w minus y big N. So now that I do that, it's kind of like squaring something. I take the square root of that result. Now, of course, I want to get rid of that square root. So how do I get rid of that square root? I square it. That's where that square of that magnitude comes from. If I get rid of that square root, what I'm left with is just this xw minus y multiplied by itself. And so I'm taking what's inside of that expression for magnitude. By squaring it, I'm getting rid of that radical. And what I'm left with is x times itself, or that quantity inside of that magnitude times itself. All right. So if I have that expression, now in matrix form, I want to take this expression for in-sample error, and I want to find where it reaches its maximum or minimum, because this is a minimization problem. We want to minimize in-sample error and therefore minimizing the difference between our best hypothesis and the ground truth unknown target function. And so to solve this minimization problem, I'm going to take the derivative with respect to the weight vector, set it to zero, and then solve for the weight vector. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we have 1 upon n, so we're going to keep that 1 upon n. And this xw minus y, magnitude quantity squared, is like taking xw minus y and multiplying it by itself. So if I said xw minus y squared, what would the derivative of that be? Well, if I were doing regular derivation using calculus that you might encounter in calculus 1, well, this 2 would factor out. So we have 2 upon n, okay? And then we're going to have this quantity. If we did a u substitution, a computed Jacobian. So here's that u substitution. And then we're going to take the derivative of this u substitution term with respect to w, because this gradient is respect to w. So in the case of der derivation, we might say d dw, the derivative with respect to w, for that expression of in-sample error, which is a function of hypothesis. So d dw of this thing, well, that's just our x transpose. All right. So we have now our expression for the derivative of in-sample error, or the gradient, is the derivative of this d dw with respect to w. And we 
note that using this upside down tri triangle standing for gradient because this is derivative is with respect to each of those weight vectors in W. So now we're going to take this expression, set it equal to zero, and then we're going to solve for that value of W that makes this equal to zero. So now we have the expression 2 upon n, x transpose, xw minus y is equal to zero. So we have equality here, and we're going to multiply both sides of equality by n. If we do that, n cancels in the denominator here, and zero times n is zero. So that's going to give us 2 x transpose xw minus y is going to equal zero. So now we divide both sides of equality by 2. Well, the 2 is going to cancel here if we divide by 2, and 0 divided by 2 is 0, so that leaves us x transpose xw minus y is equal to 0. So now we're going to multiply this x transpose. We're going to distribute that left multiplication of x transpose. We're going to distribute that over this parenthesized expression. So that's going to give us x transpose x w minus x transpose y is equal to zero. So then we're going to add x transpose w, x transpose y to both sides of the equality. Well, anything minus itself is zero, so that leaves us x transpose x w is equal to x transpose y. And so now this gives us this expression x transpose x, w is equal to x transpose y, where x is our design matrix. This is the beauty of linear algebra. We don't have to deal with individual equations. We deal with a set of equations in one, as one object. And so here, now, let's make an observation. We said this x vector, it was a, rather, this x matrix it is a row matrix where each row is one of our data vectors transpose. And so as such, we have x1 transpose through xn transpose. And this was an n by d plus 1 matrix, n rows, d plus 1 columns. And so now, if we do the transpose, that design matrix transpose we're going to switch the rows in the columns, so that's going to be a D plus 1 row by N columns. And essentially what that's doing, it's now taking our rows and making them columns. So now we're going to have our X1 vector as the first column and our XN vector as the last column. And you notice that each one of these vectors, they're column vectors now, and they're not transposed, and each one occupies a column. So these are N columns for n vectors, one in each column, and these are our d plus 1 rows, one for each feature, including that dummy variable x0. So now, if I look at the ranks of each of these, I have x transpose x. x transpose x, well, x is n, x, x transpose, rather, is d plus 1 by n, x is n by d plus 1. Now, if I multiply them together, I follow the rules of linear algebraic multiplication, row across the river to get down the stream. That resulting product of these two linear systems is going to be a d plus 1 by d plus 1 matrix. This n is going to go away. And so you notice here, d plus 1 by d plus 1 that matrix is going to be a square matrix. It's going to have D plus 1 rows and D plus 1 columns. This is a so-called square matrix. And a square matrix has interesting property. It is invertible. And so we can now calculate, after we take this product of the design matrix, X transpose X, and we can follow the procedure prescribed by rules of linear algebra, and compute the inverse x transpose x of the product of the design matrix transposed with itself. And that's going to be called x transpose x inverse. Now, of course, if we do this multiplication in linear algebra, it's 
you have to distinguish the left multiplication or right multiplication. We're going to left multiply both sides of equality by this inverse. And we know that it's invertible because all square matrices are invertible. So if we do this inverse, all right, well, let's do this inverse by left multiplying both sides of equality by this x transpose x. So this gives us, on the left-hand side, x transpose x inverse times x transpose x w is equal to x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. So if we do that, well, something times its inverse, that's going to go to identity, which is the same as saying 1 in matrix speak. And that's going to result in identity times W is equal to X transpose X quantity inverse times X transpose Y. Now, identity times anything is itself. So this gives us our result. W, our weight vector for the hypothesis that minimizes this expression for in sample error, that's where the gradient is equal to zero, that's going to be a weight vector W that is calculated by this X transpose X inverse times X transpose Y. And so if we were to give this a name, this quantity has a name, it's called a pseudo inverse of our design matrix X. Now, it's called a pseudo inverse because it's not the real inverse, but it works like an inverse. And here, we're looking at the matching up of the measurements of the matrix. So X transpose X is D plus 1 by D plus 1. It's a square matrix and therefore invertible. If you invert it, well, that's still a D plus 1 by D plus 1. So you take a D plus 1 by D plus 1, and you multiply it with a D plus 1 by N. The D plus 1 by N, so this result, that's D plus 1 by D plus 1, and X transpose is D plus 1 by N. The resulting product here, that's going to be D plus 1 by N. These inner measurements, they go away. So you have a D plus 1 by N, and then you take this D plus 1 by N, and you multiply it by y, y is n by d plus 1. So if you multiply a d plus 1 by n by that y value times y, that's times an n by d plus 1. So that resulting pseudo-inverse, these n's go away, rather that y is n by 1, not n by d plus 1. That's an error. And so that was, these ends go away, and the resulting W vector is going to be D plus 1 rows by 1 column. And that's exactly what W is. It's going to be D plus 1 rows and 1 column, including that dummy variable W0. And so that's going to give you a W value where in-sample error achieves its minimum. And that's going to be our regression solution, our final best hypothesis that we call in the anatomy of learner that we call G, because it's the final best hypothesis, the working hypothesis, that most closely mimics the labeling of the unknown target function, where we have real value labels. Okay, so this is our linear regression algorithm. You take your data set, you construct your matrix, your design matrix, and your target vector, and then you do the following. You compute the pseudo-inverse. That pseudo-inverse is just design matrix transpose times itself. Take the inverse, the matrix inverse, multiply by design matrix transpose, and then you multiply by Y, that result, to give you your W vector. Okay. So we will try an exercise on this, and regression is used all over the place to try to predict real valued quantities. It's used all the time, for example, for real estate prices, and in a short space uh, for securities or stocks.
So with that, that's all I had. When you use linear regression, one of the things that you can use it for is to decide a good starting place for weight for PLA. Now, when you pose a classification, are labels associated with the action of the unknown target function are one of two values, plus one or minus one. So if you chose to treat these plus one, minus one labels as if they were real values, which they are, belong to the set of reals, you can use regression through pseudo-inverse, pseudo-inverse on the previous slide, to come up with a value of our W vector that most closely mimics trying to assign plus one, minus one to our in-sample data. Now, of course, regression won't get it completely right, but what it will give you is a W value, a hypothesis that works as a really good starting place from which to do perceptron learning algorithm over some number of iterations. And so this gets you to a good solution for PLA much, much faster because you can compute this pseudo-inverse very, very quickly in MATLAB in about three to five lines of MATLAB. Okay, so let's take a look a little bit briefly about nonlinear transformations in general. We talked about real values for regression. Um, we also talked about linear models for PLA. What happens if your data is not linearly separable? Let's take this frame on the left. We have two-dimensional feature vectors. We have the first feature axis along the horizontal axis. We'll call that X1 hat. And we have the second feature axis along the vertical axis. Let's call that X2 hat. Now, of course, if you were to draw a coordinate system representing these features, you'd have origin right in the center, right here. Now, of course, if you look at the red points and the blue points, you see that they're arranged radially from the origin in the feature space representation in two dimensions. All of the blue points, let's imagine those were the plus one points, and all the red points, let's imagine those were the minus one points for their ground truth labels by the target function, the blue points tend to be closer to the origin, whereas the red points tend to be further away radially from the origin. Now, of course, the world is not always linear. In this case, you can't draw a straight line, a linear hypothesis that separates the blue points from the red points. You need something that's nonlinear. Now, of course, with this a transformation called a phi function, you can transform or change the geometry of your data. Now, in this particular case, if we have our data set not linearly separable, they're radially arranged relative to origin in feature space in two dimensions, what if we computed a function over the features in the original input representation, and that particular function was nonlinear, such as squaring? So then for every data point whose feature values are x1 and x2 for the first feature in x1 hat direction and the second feature in the x2 hat direction, what if we rewrote that data point by calling this phi function that said, okay, take the first feature and rewrite it as the original first feature value squared, x1 squared, and the second feature is the original second feature value x2 squared, so that's x2 squared. If we do that, that's the type of polar transformation. And what we find is that those, those points which are closer to the origin with respect to the x1 axis and the x2 axis, they're going to be closer to origin once we do this transformation. Those points, the red points that are further away along the x1 axis and the x2 axis, they're going to be further away from origin. So here we have our blue points that are close to origin and our red points that are further away from origin. So now in this new representation, that we're going to call Z space or feature space, we've run some transformation on the original input representation. And now in this new representation, the geometry has changed. In this case, it's changed such that it's linearly separable. So now then in this new representation, we can find a line through PLA that separates the blue points from the red points. And in essence, what you're doing is you're getting the benefit of being able to draw a circle, but you're only paying the cost, aside from this transformation, which you can do quite easily, you're only paying the cost of regular PLA. 
You're not paying any extra cost. But if you were to take the straight line, sample points from it, and compute the inverse function, that line in the feature space is the equivalent of finding a circle in the original representation. And so now you can take this humble, simple line on the plane and through some transformation that's nonlinear, get the ability to draw nonlinear shapes like circles and squiggles and bending and falling, but you only pay the cost from the machine learning perspective of training a linear model in this feature space. And so now we can take the same framework for linear learning and get the benefit of nonlinear decision making. Okay. And so one of the things I did, shameless plug in my own research, is I said, okay, well, transforming the geometry of your feature space, it works well, but it's transforming every single region of feature space the same way. Sometimes you might want to transform different parts of feature space differently. Let's take, for example, you have data, and maybe that data is clustered so that you have some plus points here, and you have some minus points here. And maybe near the seams in this region of feature space, they tend to be closer together, jumbled together. But in this region of feature space here, I'll identify it with a rectangle, and here, they're not as jumbled together. So wouldn't it be nice then if you could transform feature space in a way that it's not the same transformation, it's a little different in different regions of feature space? Well, one of the ideas that I developed with my graduate student was instead of transforming the feature space, transform the measurement device, that measure that you use to determine if two points are similar to one another, the distance measure. And in doing so, now you can customize the way you determine if points are like one another and get the same effect as transforming the geometry. And so we call this range transformation, and there's the journal article, and we use a transformation on L2 norm in order to improve clustering. And so that's my shameless plug for some research I did. I'm a graduate student. Uh, feel free to download and look at the paper. And this was an alternative we offered to transforming en masse the entire feature space that sometimes we want to customize how you transform the feature space, and transforming the distance measure between points is, gives you the same effect as transforming the geometry of feature space, and this is customizable. Okay, so with that, that's all I had. We'll end there, and as usual, please stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you all on Tuesday.